Hello and welcome to the Friday Focus. How are you doing today, Mr. Vrobel? I'm doing great, TJ. How are you? I am living the dream. And again, we, I'm, I'm still working on a way to like kind of easily fade into that hard stop, but you know, <laughs> it's good. It wakes everybody up and they're like, whoa, they're here. They're here. They're ready to rock and roll. And that's exactly Keep what your we hands are and doing. legs inside the roller coaster. It may come <laughs> to a sudden stop. Exactly. And that's just like, boom, get out, move. Come on. got to get the next one in here. <laughs> so today we are talking about the photo news and that's what we do each and every Friday at this time. I mean, we're, we're a few it's late today, but normally at noon on Friday, uh, we come at you with all the hot goss, as uh, some people have said to us, all the hot gossip in the photo news industry. And I'm shared. My name is TJ Houston. I'm the business development manager here at Pixel Connection, uh, and I am joined with my friend, Mike Robel. You might know him as Dad Cooks Dinner. And what I love about this live stream that then becomes a podcast is that we have both sides of the industry in that we have a working uh, photographer and Mike. He has an awesome uh, food blog slash food feed that's on Instagram. You got to go check it out. And then me from the retailer side who just loves to geek out on camera gear. So it's kind of like that balanced look at the photo news industry. And, you know, we definitely both early on were like, Hey, we just geek out on the photo news and all the rumors and all the all the hot goss. So that's what you are in for today. So I wanted to do a quick shout out to a few people. Hello, Mike Giuliano. I, I look forward to this every week just like you do, my friend. Les Greenberg says, hello, TJ. Hope you're doing well, my friend. Tim Hoffman over there on the East Coast. The, I, I, I don't, the, uh, the, the weather I don't, I, is better in Boston today. Ah, the Weta, the Weta in Boston. Ah, see, you're, see, you picked up on that. I did not. So hello, <laughs> Mr. Hoffman, and hello, Jen Stitt. I hope you are doing well. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into it. I want to let you guys know uh, that we do showcase a creator of the week, and this week it is our friend um, Aaron. He actually came and picked up the D780 for the contest that we're running and just shared some awesome photos. And it was a great mix of a wedding that he was shooting, but also some great landscape. So do yourself a fa favor and head over to at A-A-R-O-N Richard on Instagram and give him a follow. He is our creator of the week and has some great stuff up on his feed. So thank you, Aaron, for jumping on and, you know, sharing those awesome photos from the D780. And that is something that we're doing the rest of the month of September. It is a free three-day rental, and we will be uh, picking from the people that submit their photos and use hashtag the Pixel Connection, hashtag, hashtag Nikon Creates to win a myriad of prizes. So we definitely urge you to take advantage of that. So I also want to let you know that yesterday we recorded another episode of the Talking Pixels podcast. This is where Justin and I talk all about the business of photography, where we it's the opposite of this show in that we we talk less about gear and what's going on in the industry, but more about business and how you can take your business from a hobby to a career. And yesterday we talked to a local photography, a photographer just about her creative journey. So that'll be coming out in a couple weeks, but you can go subscribe now. It is available on all the podcasting platforms, including Apple and Spotify. So go ahead and jump on that. So some housekeeping notes, uh, we will be closed on Monday for the um, Labor Day weekend. So we will see you again on Tuesday from 10 to 7, Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 7, and then on Saturday from 10 to 5. We've been getting a lot of calls asking if we're open uh, with COVID and everything. And yep, we are open and we are making sure that we are keeping everything nice and clean for you. We're making sure that everything's disinfected and that you have a safe and fun shopping experience while you're here. Also, if you don't feel comfortable coming in, that's totally fine. You can just do the curbside pickup or the online uh, delivery options. We have free shipping on thousands of items on our website, uh, or we do the curbside pickup as well. So what are our goals for today? Number one is we want to update you on the photography related news that you might have missed. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. So photo news and what cool gadgets come out. That's not really something that's found on your nightly news. So that's why every Friday we come and talk about it here. And this is really just kind of our opinions on what's going on in the photo industry. 
But number one is to pull you away from the fear, the uncertainty and doubt that is going on, you know, whether that's in your photography business, whether that's in your personal life, you know, photography, we all have this thing in common, and that's being a creator and photography, videography. So if we can pull you away from that fear, uncertainty and doubt, even if it is for just a half hour to an hour every Friday, then that's a mission accomplished for us. And then finally, our goal is to get you motivated to try something new. Again, that's where the magic happens. That's where you become a better photographer, a better creative, a better artist is when you try something new. So that's why every week we also put some inspirational articles in there in hopes that we can find um, something that gets you outside of your comfort zone. And this week was a pretty heavy news week, but we do have a few um, motivations in there. So let's go ahead and get into today's news. First and foremost, this was an awesome one. The Lumix S5 has been finally announced. So did you read up on this at all? Did you see what it was all about? Oh, yeah. I've been reading up and looking at all the videos. And so I, I think it looks like a great camera, but it leaves me with a bunch of questions. So it's coming in at about $2,000 slightly under the price of their current S1 with a lot of the same specs, but in a nice compact body. Uh, they are, they're saying it's the size of their current G9 or GH5 body, which is really small for a for full frame camera. So it looks like a really nice package. It's got nice specs. I am still not a fan of the depth from defocus autofocus. They say and it's that's better. I read it. I was gonna say I read that it is a little bit better on this, and from some friends right. that I know that have shot it, uh, they said it is a noticeable improvement. And those improvements are gonna roll into the S1, S1R, and S1H as well. Um, but I, I'm with you. You know, there's definitely um, some room to grow when with the autofocus. Although yep. they have they have made it a little bit better with this latest option. And I, it's hard for me to say we didn't get it, you know, in person to play with. So I can't tell you like my honest, you know, actually was shooting it. But as soon as we do, uh, our plan is to put together some content around, you know, the camera in general. But I'm really excited for the, some of the things that they did with this camera. Number one, fully articulating screen. They definitely mm -hmm. had to do that. Uh, the smaller form factor, GH5, GH5S, or I'm sorry, GH5, G9, are just ergonomically feel really good in the hands. And when I left Panasonic, like they had to pry the G9 away from me because I love that camera so much. <laughs> so the fact that now there's a full frame option coming, I think that that's like in that package. I think that's really, really enticing. And I'm like you on some of these purchases. I'm like, just keep the credit card put in the wallet. You know, I just, <laughs> I just made the switch to Fuji. I don't really want to make that switch again, but this is definitely yep. going to be a camera that I rent and I, you know, put some frames through it. And then also what was interesting was the fact that in the future firmware update, they said by the end of the year, this will yeah. have the 5.9 K raw video recording. So wow. to me, that's for the price that you're getting to get a camera that can do, you know, almost the 6 K raw recording. I, that's huge. And I think that's also leads credence to what this camera is going to be available to do with firmware updates in the future. And an, another part of this is the, you know, the lenses that also got released. And I feel like these were kind of passed by in a lot of the new cycles, but, but Panasonic is very much dedicated to this new full frame lineup of cameras, the S series. And a lot of people have been saying, well, now that the size is down smaller, you know, what does this mean for micro four thirds? And I'd like to know your, you know, your thoughts on this, having shot micro four thirds in the past. I mean, do you think Panasonic's going to get away from it? Uh, I am, they, they have said that they see that there is a, the micro four thirds format has a place in the market. If you need really compact, if you need long lenses, if you need not a lot of rolling shutter, because that small sensor is a lot easier to avoid roll, rolling shutter on, there is a place for micro four thirds. The problem is, is that it feels like it is kind of stagnated. Obviously, Panasonic is putting their efforts towards the L Mount Alliance. And it's good to see them releasing these new lenses for it for the L mount series, but the last time they had a new lens for micro four thirds was over a year ago. The, what was it? The 17 to well, something F 1.7, 1.8, which oh, is an amazing lens. And but... that was just an update. They had the 12 to 25. 
And then the other one, I think it was just an update, or they brought it back. So it's been a little bit since they've had like. Oh, that's right. They updated uh, the 50 equivalent. Right. Yes. But yeah, I'm. It sure seems like Panasonic believes the world is moving towards full frame. And, you know, this S5 looks like a fantastic camera for that. But yeah, if you can give me the body size, it's the same as their micro four thirds. Uh, the only thing is the lenses. Uh, the, you have to have large lenses. And that was one of the big advantages to the micro four thirds system is the lenses were a lot smaller and lighter. The, you know, just the laws of physics. You need those big lenses to make it work Large with the bigger optics. sensor. Absolutely. But, yeah, I, I nice think, uh, these are the ones that are planned, and these seem like they are going to be that smaller form factor. You know, the right. 24, 35, 50, and 85 all coming out in one eighth. So also I'm hoping that means affordability for the line as well, that they can, yeah. you know, have these smaller lenses that are more affordable for photographers who are, you know, in the market for that circa $2,000 camera that, you know, the 75 to 300 nice, you know, long zoom, but also, you know, having these set of small primes that are hopefully affordable as well. So again, it's great to see that the Elmont Alliance is growing, that there are more options for, you know, though that line of shooter and also for FP shooters out there and Leica shooters that you now have more lenses that are coming for the system again the fp is a very compact system so i could see where these are going to pair very well with those yeah and i wanted to to mention the kit lens that comes with the s5 is they're releasing it with the 20 to 60 kit lens and yes it's a kit lens it's not as good as a as a constant aperture f28 but i love that zoom range i love the extra wide 20 millimeter on the zoom instead of the usual 24 to 70, 24 to 105. I think that the extra wide is going to be a big selling point for a lot of people. So I really like that they're including that lens in the kit. Yeah. And if you do head over to our YouTube channel, we did a first look review on the 20 to 60 and kind of shared some example photos and our thoughts. So if you are looking at the S5 or possibly the S5 kit, we definitely urge you to go take a look at that video and get kind of a better feel for what that lens can do because for a kit lens it's actually it's not bad it's a nice size too nice compact so again i think it's going to pair well with the s5 so the new Boca master it has arrived the F fuji 50 i'm sorry the fujinon 50 millimeter f 1.0 has been announced and uh we did put a video together so if you head over to um, our blog, there's a whole write-up about the lens and different focus tests and whatnot, and there will be also a video on that page, um, or if you go to our pre-order page, this video is up there where we kind of get hands-on and talk about the lens, but it is, it's nice. It is really, really nice. <laughs> I was so jealous when I heard you were, you had a pre-release copy to put this video together on, and uh, uh, but I've already got my pre-order in. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Yep. Uh, the, yep. the news is it's coming September 25th, so uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting impatiently. Yes, and I mean, just to talk a little bit about the lens, um, number one, it's the fastest autofocus um digital lens out there there was a canon okay, f1 hold, lens hold up hold on there. yeah we, we have to get all the qualifiers fastest uh where, where's my notes fastest autofocus mirrorless yep. interchangeable lens there we dagger, go double dagger I've... asterisk asterisk <laughs> Exactly. And there's already people that are like, well, on a full frame body, this will be blah. that that's the internet. But the right. the news here is it's a 50 millimeter lens. It's an F1 lens. Uh, it's a large lens for the Fuji lineup, um, but it's not overbearing. It's not too big. I feel like with my X-T4 um, and the X-T3, it felt very balanced, especially if you have a grip. Like I have um, an L bracket that stays on my X-T4 at all times. So that little bit of extra weight, a little bit of extra grip. Um, made it super comfortable for me uh, in shooting it. But again, this is a it's a solid lens, really, really sharp lens as well. And a lot of people are connect or comparing it to the 50 that's out already and the 56. Like, why would they come out with this lens if they already have those lenses? And I will say it's a very different lens in that the 50 F2 focuses a lot closer. It's a lot smaller. The 56, again, there's just a magic about that lens that it's a very distinct look and feel that comes with that. The 50 is going to have its own where, you know, the, you know, that blurry background and it's not overdone either. It's a nice fall off. I mean, it's just, again, it's a beautiful optic and I'm excited that I got to play with it ahead of time. And this is also one that's on my pre-order list as well. Um, 
because this is a lens as a portrait photographer that I'm going to be using a lot, a lot. Yeah, it sure seems like this is the the best choice for portrait photographers in the Fuji lineup, uh, replacing that 56 f1.2, which again is a is a legendary lens. A lot of people really like it, but I've always thought that the bokeh is a little busy, and I know that's a, a personal preference kind of thing. But the the samples I've seen of the new f1.0 versus the old f1.2, the bokeh on the new lens is is smooth and buttery and looks amazing. And and gimme, 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 I want it now. <laughs> I can't wait for it to be here. Cannot wait. So jumping on, this is one that, um, this is not not a, hum, not a humble brag. I don't want it to be like that. I want it to be more like, thank you, our customers. And the, I put a Facebook post out, you know, saying thank you so much to everybody involved with us receiving the e-tailer of the year. And without customers like you that are watching right now, it wouldn't at all be possible. Each and every day we wake up and we think of different ways that we can help creators, whether that's getting the right stuff in stock, putting the right stuff on rentals, um, just being here to answer the phones and you know educate and help creators that's what we do each and every day so this year we were chose as digital imaging reporters uh e-tailer of the year uh and this awesome team that you see here um is a small part of the reason why it really is the customers like you guys so again i wanted to thank you guys so much for supporting us um a little bit about it's digital imaging reporter so it basically is um a magazine that reports on the digital imaging, whether that's camera stores, whether that's video, whether that's printing, you know, just digital imaging as a whole. So we were chosen as the e-tailer of the year. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, it's well-deserved. And uh, for those of you that aren't a Pixel Connection employee like me, uh, I love behind the curtain kind of look at businesses. Uh, so if you want to find out a little bit about all the friendly faces you see at Pixel every day, uh, go check them out, including some information on my very own co-host, TJ. Absolutely. So just wanted to put that out there and say thank you. So this, I'll let you run with this one. Oh, good Lord. So this, I want to file this one in the horror section right next to all the Stephen King novels. This is, um, let me get the quote here up because uh, this this is a teardown by Lens Rentals of a GFX 100 that they rented out. And the quote is, it went out in a rental and got used in a dive housing. Quote unquote, suddenly for no reason it died except on further investigation and follow up with the customer. Well, maybe it got a little bit, just a little bit, but it was working for a while after it got wet. And oh my goodness, I had no idea that salt water was so awful. I mean, it, the teardown of this lens is again, one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen because what they're showing you there is the tripod plate. If you can right. see the image on the screen and that's the salt water seeping its way in through the tripod plate. And they said their experience is, is if you remove the tripod plate and you see that, the camera's done. They might as well just throw it in the trash at this point. Uh, but being lens rentals, what they chose to do was tear it apart to see if anything was salvageable for spare parts. And because it's kind of what they do, they, they like getting into these things and seeing how they work. And so it, again, it's a combination of some of the most horrifying things I've ever seen going on in a camera. Just the corrosion in there from just the little bit of salt water that crept in <laughs> is awful to see, but it's also fascinating to see how Fuji got this big of a sensor working, especially with IBIS. I think the other quote I liked from it was the IBIS is strong enough that it could stabilize a small child if it needed to. <laughs> Exactly. And I guess this is also a um, kind of a public service announcement to just how fast salt water works. The fact that this, you know, had gotten wet and then by the time they had gotten it back, it was already starting to corrode and eat away at the electronics and, you know, making its way in. So, again, yeah, it, it, it apparently you know, it got wet and they wiped it off immediately. So the person who had rented it thought, you know, it, it got a slight dunk. It's supposed to be water resistant. I should be fine. Uh, it wasn't fine. No, not at all. And then uh, Jen did comment um, 
from experience, you can also get condensation in dive housings. You need to add moisture eater pack into your housings depending on the dive depth. So they could have not uh -huh. known that, but also good, um, very good, good uh, tip there. Because <laughs> I know um, Isaac Coffey, who we've had on the um, live streams before and was also a speaker at PhotoFest, he does some underwater portraiture. So, you know, even just that little bit, you know, going into a four foot pool, you know, could cause issues. And then real quick, this one snuck in late, but hey guys, happy Friday from Cleveland Heights. So hello, our friend over at Tech Gear Talk. So again, friend just a PSA, you. make sure that you're keeping your camera dry and just how quickly it can, you know, just eat away. Even if you're out by the, you know, doing a long exposure and a wave, you know, crashes over, that could be the end for your camera. So again, oh. make sure that you have the proper coverage in place, whether that's your, you know, if you're not a professional, that it's under your homeowner's policy, but also, you know, extended Mac warranties are great for accidental, um, or if you are a business, obviously having that type of liability insurance there. Wouldn't be liability, it would be equipment insurance, not liability insurance. But I am not an insurance agent. You should talk to your <laughs> insurance agent. I'm your Friday news guy. Yep. So moving on from there into our rumor roundup as we, there we go. We, we got to have the sound effects. I, I have the board. I have the board, so I might as well. <laughs> so starting off this, I, got, I feel like this is the rumor that just won't go away. Uh, Every single week for like the last month it's been in here. So what's going on with this new full frame e-mount thing? What, what do we think is happening now? Okay, so you remember all that stuff that we've been telling you about an A5 or an A6 thousand dollar full frame Sony? Yeah, forget all that. Um, I, the, the, my favorite quote on this was, you know, these rumors have been coming through Sony Alpha Rumors, and Jared Polin, the YouTube photography guy, Frono's Photo, said, Sony Alpha Rumors, motto, 27% of the time, we're right 99% of the time. They they just seem to be willing to throw everything at the wall and see if it sticks. And in this case, what it looks like is is all the rumors of a small, compact rangefinder body A7 is now this A7C, which is going to be a two thousand dollar camera, not a one thousand dollar camera, with a flip out screen, uh, fully adjustable, using their standard Z battery and with basically the same sensor that the A7 III has. Uh, and this one is marketed more towards video people, but not people who are looking for a camera as expensive as the A7S III that came out. And this rumor seems more solid than all of the other ones that Sony Alpha Rumors has been sharing about the A5, A6, uh, because there's a lot of specs tied to it. And I hope he's right this time around, but uh, this is also the guy who rumored that the A7S III was coming back in 2017 and 2018 and 2019, and we finally got it in 2020. So I think he has good sources. I just think that sometimes those sources are over-interpreting based on the data they're getting. Like for the A5 or the A6, I wouldn't be surprised if it's out there, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it's a lot farther out there than they've been reporting. So could you imagine if they came out with like a A7 S3 that's just been pared down? So you can see some of the things mm -hmm. that they're calling out here, like having, you know, one SD card slot. You're seeing the fully articulating screen. Hopefully we get the new menus, the new color science. But does this become the go to vlog camera? Right. Yeah, this feels like it's going to be their A7 III replacement, and it does feel like it would be a great vlogging camera. You've got Sony's autofocus. You've got you know their their good sensors. Uh, I if I was in the market, I'd be seriously looking at this camera. Uh, oh, uh, can you hit the breaking news? Oh yes, yeah, this just breaking news button. So so breaking news. Oh, wrong one. Wrong one. Whoops. Ah, there we go. We even practiced. There we go. <laughs> so, so, breaking news from Sony Alpha Rumors. The A7C is coming in black and silver. Woo! So, so Pentax would like to uh, have a word about their the, <laughs> how fun we were making of their release announcement last week. And Fuji would like to say, hey, get off my lawn. And Leica would like to say, wait, that was my idea first. But apparently, it's coming in black and silver. Wow, fancy. Now, I'm trying to think, did they... I think there was like A6000, I think, came in multiple. I think there was a silver A6000, but I don't think Sony's really done anything other than the plain 
plain yeah, black. I, I don't remember yeah. any other than basic black, but you know, you're, you know, I didn't follow the A6000 line back when it first came out as closely. So you may be right. But yeah, this does feel like a departure for Sony where they're they're doing something other than just the straight black camera. And you wonder, like going after silver, going for the rangefinder style, do you think that they're looking at Fuji or do you think that they're just, a you know, they're far enough ahead that they don't even look at the competitive landscape like that? Like, or do you think they're going to try to go for that rangefinder market? Um, I'm sure they're thinking about it, at least from a, well, hey, you know, we've got this other line that sells pretty well as a rangefinder body and people seem to like the different colors that they can get stuff in. So why not? put one out there. I mean, Sony's a big enough manufacturing unit that they can probably make whatever they felt like. They could make it in green and pink and purple if they felt like they needed to. So okay. if, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're looking at the market and saying, yeah, you know, those Fujis are selling pretty well. Maybe we should do that ourselves. It's interesting that it says mid-September too. I mean, right on the heels of the A7S S3. Uh, we had our right. launch event yesterday for the, or touch and try event uh, for the A7S S3. And it's just crazy that it's already they're looking at something, you know, that fast and full disclosure, I haven't heard anything about this. Um, right. I know just as much as you guys on this. Um, it'll be interesting though. It'll be cool. Yeah. Moving right along from that, the 10 to 24 F four. Um, oh, I just, I just got a, uh, another little note here from my trusty uh -oh. backstage fact checkers. The a 6,000 came in black white and silver so thank you white senor eeyore for interesting um, making sure that we bring nothing but the best to our news <laughs> audience here so moving on to the fuji fujinon sorry i tried to put like fuji x there as i'm reading 10 to tour 10 to 24 f4 mark 2 and it sounds like that it's really just weather sealing that they're adding so, yeah, so that there are two lenses that are rumored to be Mark II versions of what were some of the earlier Fuji lenses when they first came out with the X lineup, uh, the 27 F2.8 and the 10 to 24. And the 10 to 24, that is my go to landscape lens. I love the size, I love the range, but it's not weather sealed. And you know, for a landscape lens, that's, that's not good. If I'm heading out there, you know, and the weather's kind of dicey, then, you know, I, I want that extra protection. Uh, see aforementioned saltwater article, you know, non-saltwater is nowhere near as, as corrosive, but it's still not a great thing to get in your camera. Um, the other thing is, is, and this is a minor annoyance, but still, it has an aperture ring. It has a fixed aperture, but there are no numbers on the aperture ring. You can't look at it and say, I'm an F2.8, I'm an F4, I'm an automatic. It's just a ring unmarked on the camera. And I saw prototypes of the lens that had the numbers on it. Why didn't they put them on the lens? It makes sense. And that, um, I'm confused being a new food, newer Fuji shooter. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm confused by that same exact thing. Like I almost get caught up like, oh, I have to make sure that this little button on the side is, you know, if I want it for aperture priority mode or I want to like dial it in, it's kind of confusing like user interface wise. So, you know, for me, I have two 10 to 24s currently, um, but I'm not, I, I feel like weather sealing and having that aperture ring, it's, it's probably enough for me to pick up a third, to be honest, yep. and sell the other ones. Yeah, and uh, and uh, that lens and the one I'm about to talk about, I've already sent them in to be replaced, and I am kind of regretting it. I'm wor worried. That I, I wanted to sell them used before the prices went down, but I use that 10 to 24 a lot, so I'm hoping Fuji doesn't wait a long time before releasing this Mark II version. Um, there's a rumor f from Fuji Alpha Rumors, who is pretty consistently right, unlike the Sony rumors guy, uh, that there is going to be an announcement of a new Fuji body coming in mid-October, but that's everything he knows. So maybe these are going to get announced then. Uh, but the other one is one of their original launch lenses, I think, the 27 millimeter pancake. Uh, and this one also, you know, not only didn't it have an unmarked aperture ring, it had no aperture ring. And if you're used to using the Fuji, that's where I go to adjust my aperture as I reach for the lens. And not having it on that lens, even though it's compact and I love the pictures it took and it would be a great walking around in the city lens, that lack of an aperture ring, it sat on my shelf and I would always reach for the 23 F2 because it had that ring. 
So that's another one I just shipped in to sell used and am looking forward to this replacement too. I hope soon. And then also too, I believe, wasn't this 27 when it first came out, all the prototypes had the aperture ring and then they took it off right before it was shipped out. So it's interesting that they made that choice then. And now they're like, Hey, let's, let's, let's wait for Mark two. Then we'll put the aperture ring in. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I and I also have to admit just a little bit of disappointment in that I was hoping Fuji was going to come out. I mean, they do need to refresh some of their lineup. The other the fifty millimeter f one we talked about earlier is kind of a refresh of the fifty six. Uh, they one of the big advantages of that f one is the new autofocus motor in it. I mean, it needs a lot of autofocus to move all that glass around, but it's a lot better and quicker autofocus than was on the F5.6. And they have a bunch of older lenses that could use that kind of a refresh. But I'm also hoping, like, where is, I want a really wide prime. Where is a 12, a 10, maybe even a 9? I've got my 9 millimeter Lawa that I use with my Fuji, but I'd love to see Fuji do an ultra wide prime lens but it doesn't look like it's going to be on the roadmap until at least 2021. Absolutely. Canon EOS M. <laughs> this, this one kills me. And I'm going to try to drag this one out a little bit because just because of the stream and like where we're at. Uh, but I right. would like to know um, tech gears talk, tech gears talk on this because he has done a lot on the M series over on his channel, specifically the M 50. He has an M 50 user group. So I'm going to, I'm hoping that we talk long enough about this that he can kind of chime in. Uh, but it sounds like, so over the last couple of weeks, we've been, you know, talking about this, maybe, you know, 7D Mark II level of camera that's coming to the M line that would promise dual card slots, maybe IBIS, you know, just giving professionals a smaller form factor crop sensor body. But it sounds like that it's not going to happen. It sounds like they're going RF. Yeah. And so, so I'm torn on this rumor. Uh, I don't, like it, but I think it's probably true and it's probably where Canon's going. Uh, they they just don't seem to be supporting the M mount with lenses and they're great cameras. I mean, again, Sagi from Tech Gear Talk is a big fan. He's not the only one. There's a lot of people who like, you know, I like me, I shoot Fuji because I like the smaller APS-C bodies. This is Canon's equivalent and it's a good body and it has some good lenses, but it doesn't have the full lens support that a, a real camera should have. And it looks like Canon's answer to that is, well, let's throw all of our weight behind the RF mount and do what Nikon's doing with their Z cameras and come out with an APS-C sensor, but RF mount body. Is this true? This is, again, Canon rumors who are also pretty good, but they're also putting this way down on their reliability number, so this may not be true. It's just that this one feels true to me. It feels like Canon is letting the EOS M line up with her, and this, you know, that's going to be the end of it next year. And now, no, all I mean, knowing so, Canon's ahead, like, I was going to say, knowing Canon's lens engineering, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue the fact that Canon makes some pretty kick ass glass. I mean, it's sharp, it's quality. Nobody ever got fired for using Canon glass on set. So that I know of. So <laughs> I could see where they have, they could have figured something out with the RF design that they're able to get that smaller form factor. I mean, we're seeing that from even like with Sigma, with the Elmont Alliance, with that new 85, like they're able to get a little bit smaller. I wonder if the RF, if they've already, you know, created a way that they can make super small lenses. I mean, the 35 that's out now is pretty small. Um, they're 35 macro, but I'm wondering if they can even push that further in order to make it even smaller, because I think they have to. I think they have to make the lenses smaller to really appeal to that market. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll have, you know, like uh, Panasonic, we were talking about earlier, you know, the lineup of F1.8 lenses because they're smaller. But just that RF mount is so massive, There's you can only make the glass so fa- small and make it still fit in that mount. So I, I have a feeling, you know, again, uh, I'm glad I'm a Fuji user because I like the APS-C size and they're the only ones who seem to really make th- that their focus, releasing lenses for that APS-C size. And Canon never seemed to really get that focus for this lineup. And and again, that's why this may not be true, but it kind of feels true to me. Yeah, I guess if we look back too, there's not really a ton 
like I'm, I'm processing this in my head right now. So I'm sorry if this doesn't come off like super polished, but if we look at like the lineup of cameras, like the 7D Mark II, um, the 80D, 90D, there's not really a ton of professional crop lenses out there. I mean, they, I mean the EF lenses obviously work on them, but they're, they've, I guess they've never really been committed to crop like they have for full frame. So, I mean, yeah. should we be surprised that this is the case? Yeah, and I think I think again the the advantage to the 70D etc was those that was the EF mount. You could just slap the EF lens on for the full frame. I mean, sure, it's a lot bigger than it needed to be, but it was there and they were available. Whereas the M mount, you got to adapt. And I know Canon's adapters are very good, but again, if I'm shooting the M, I want I I want native glass for it, and they haven't been providing it. Yeah, and that's so I think that this does lead credence to the going RF. I mean, just the fact oh, that they've already, they've already, they did it with EF. So, yeah, like the, the strange thing, though, is, is it still sounds like they're planning on releasing the high end M body. This rumor said both things at the same time. And yes, theoretically, both are true. But why would they release the high end body and then kill the whole line the next year? Uh, right. I I mean, and maybe they're just going to keep it around to support the people who've bought into it for, for a while and just not develop anything new for it. But I don't know. Again, all, this is all rumors and we're, we're kind of you know, way off the map here. But again, this one just feels true to me. Absolutely. Same here. So moving on to our education and tutorials block. So uh, found this one uh, actually last week. So like a camera... Um, like a USA is doing a woman photo product or I'm sorry, project. So you can win a pretty sizable amount of money with this project. And um, I, I love that they're dedicating this directly to, you know, female photographers that are out there. Um, again, if you want more information about this, um, you can just, you know, head over to Leica's website um, up there at the top. You'll see where it says world of Leica and you'll be able to see, you know, what all goes into something like this, but I, I definitely urge you to um, jump in and see if it's something that you know you would be interested in as you know this photo project and get some get some cash money for them to fund the project. Yeah, and I, I thought it was interesting that this is less of a contest like I'm used to seeing and more of a they're going to sponsor a big project. You, know, you have to submit a portfolio of images and you know, at least a certain number of them have to have been made within the last year or two and you have to explain what you think the project is and how it relates to women and or photography and or both and you know they, they will they will fund your project and give you a like a Q2 while you're at it. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Moving on. So this was a very um, in-depth video about um, adapters and crops and, you know, crop factor and then using speed boosters versus adapters. So again, this is, there's a lot of math involved. Um, and our friend, uh, Siggy, definitely, he apologizes for that. Uh, but definitely if you're looking, if you're wondering about like how adapters work and how it affects your, you know, why is it called a focal reducer? And, you know, definitely it's worth taking a look if you want some education in the, um, crop factor and, you know, using different adapters. And just, again, this is more of an educational thing. It's less of a review, less of, you know, what's new, what's hot. It's really some. it's more like a textbook versus, you know, a textbook that's good to watch versus just something like a magazine that you would read. Would that be a good way to say it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, again, shout outs to Tech Gear Talk, friend of the show. And uh, Sigi, you did a great tutorial here. Don't apologize for the math. You know, I'm, I'm a computer geek in my day job, and I'm more than happy to see the math just to see how it all works. Um, the one thing he pointed out, you know, because I, I kind of know the difference between an adapter and a speed booster, but I learned a whole bunch of stuff from watching this video. And the thing that just crystallized it for me as Sagi says that a speed booster is kind of like a teleconverter, except it's the opposite, where instead of 1.4 times, it's 0.7 times. And it's taking advantage of a full frame lens that you're using on a crop sensor body and widening it to give you that full frame equivalent, which just crystallized it for me that, oh, it's a teleconverter just in reverse. It's like, 
why didn't anyone ever explain it that way? That was that was a brilliant way to put it, Sagi. Thank you. So well done, my friend. Well done. Uh, this one I thought was pretty cool. Uh, these are photo hacks for any camera. Um, so in this uh, video slash uh, news article, um, it's basically different ways to get unique perspectives, but also focus the user. And the one thing I liked about this was just how easy, you know, just sim simple things like taking your phone and putting it up against the lens to get kind of that reflection. Let's see if it, let's see if it works here. Oh, look at that floating. Oh yeah. There you Ooh. go. Very nice. <laughs> so this, this is one of the hacks that they have where you can, um, you know, just get different unique perspectives or uh, for like the example photo here that was used, you know, there was a bunch of people kind of in front of him. So he was able to just pop the phone right up there, you know, get them out of the frame and, you know, create some pretty cool art. So again, if you're looking for a little bit of inspiration, if you're looking for, you know, just some things to have in your back pocket, you know, your photographer's tool belt, if you will, uh, this article is great for that. There's a ton of really cool ideas on how you can use your phone to get cool compositions. Right. And the, the one thing he slipped in there is, yes, your phone is really good for this, but if you're a fully kitted out photographer who has a neutral density filter on them, you can use that as well. So, and, and it, because it's bigger, it works a little better with a real camera for this type of an image like he has there where he's making the reflection. So pro tip. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Lots of good inspiration there. So if you're looking for more inspiration, um, I need to update this graphic because it changes every week. Uh, but join us July 27th, 28th and 29th for Pixel Photo Fest. And you want to get registered now. Uh, we're targeting about uh, five to seven hundred people there. So, again, if you are interested in learning just a little bit more about photography, uh, we have the whole gamut of photography, photo related speakers that we're going to be announcing very soon. Uh, but again, this photo fest this year was virtual. We're hoping next year that it will be in person like all of our previous ones. Uh, but again, it's an awesome hands-on experience where you can learn a ton about photography. But until then, we do want to tide you over with letting you know that our YouTube channel is chock full of all of our previous live streams, but also videos like the uh, focus, or I'm sorry, the 50 millimeter that we did, uh, where we talk about, you know, the new lenses, the new products, things like that over on our YouTube channel. If you just go to youtube.com slash the pixel connection, you'll find all the videos that we've done in the past, all the live streams, all of the most up-to-date ed educational content can be found there. And then I also want to let you know that every week we do a couple live streams. I'm sorry, I have a phone sitting here by me. Uh, we do live streams every Wednesday and Friday. So Wednesday is where we kind of learn something new. And then Friday is where we talk all about the news. So join us here every Wednesday and Friday at noon just to further your, you know, online or further your photography, you know, thoughts, your creativeness online, uh, or you can visit us in person. So we do have classes that are also running. So it's almost every day we're running a new class. So from, you know, Canon and Nikon basics to how to start a podcast. So all those things happen in store and we do our best to make sure everybody's socially distant. We only have uh, up to six in the store at a time. So again, we're doing our part to make sure that it's a comfortable learning experience for you as well. So did you know that we do have camera user groups? So the um, we're actually broadcasting to them right now. Uh, the Midwest Lumix user group, the Ohio Olympus user, and the Ohio Fuji fam are all different groups where we start putting, you know, helping like-minded individuals get together. So that way, if there are questions that come up regarding your camera uh, or your lenses or just the, you know, you could celebrate the love of the system. And each week we put like little contests in there. So if you haven't checked these out yet, definitely do yourself a favor and just do a search for uh, these three and more more will be coming very soon. And if some people, uh, we actually get this question a lot, like, hey, how, where can we find these links? Like, I can't click on your video. You know, how, what's going on? So <laughs> we do put these out every Friday in email form. You just head over to our website and subscribe to our newsletter, uh, and you will get a copy of today's slides, and they'll be in kind of newsletter format. So if you have any questions before that, I just want to let you know that you can reach out to us, um, sales or social at thepixelconnection.com. You can find us on Instagram at the.pixelconnection, Facebook, phone, anything, um, any way that you can get a hold of us. We try to be available on absolutely all platforms. And where can people find you online, my friend? I am um, my food writing and food photography are at dadcooksdinner.com or you can find me at dadcooksdinner on most of the socials. 
Absolutely. And if you need anything from me personally, you can find me on Instagram at, at underscore TJ Houston, or just do a Google search for TJ Houston. I'm sure you'll find me. Well, I don't know about you, but this is a three-day weekend, so I think it's about time that we go ahead <laughs> and focus on the weekend. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate it. Another Friday Focus is behind us, and I'm going to enjoy my weekend. Have a good one, everybody. Bye, everybody.